I um, wasn't expecting to see you all again from this point of view, <laughs> but Pastor Sam is full of surprises, and uh, we are thankful to Pastor Sam and Shirini and all of you really uh, for being here. We've enjoyed our time here, and it's is sad for us to leave. You know, when a missionary comes to a new country or to a new place we've never been before, we're, we're kind of like stray dogs. And so having a meal afterwards is really great. <laughs> stray dogs like to get fed. And so you've kind of adopted the stray dogs here, or maybe we've adopted you. I don't know, maybe both ways there, but uh, we, we've enjoyed it all. And uh, I've been blessed by all of you, Debbie and I both. And uh, uh, we'll miss you all, but uh, who knows? Well, I'm sure we'll see you again somewhere, someplace, sometime. So, well, um, we are in Revelation chapter 10 at verse 4. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, we're kind of, uh, that's where I left off last time. Oh, and I have to apologize. I normally have a PowerPoint, but I forgot it. We moved yesterday, and it's in one of seven different suitcases. <laughs> I'm sure I'll find it one of these days, but uh, somewhere. But, and I, I had this really cool picture, too, because we're going to get into chapter 11 with the two witnesses, you know. And this is like an image of the two witnesses with fire coming out of their mouth and burning up everything around them. And it was really cool looking. So I was really excited about that. Maybe a little bit too excited about it, but it was... Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll show that on Zoom, yeah. So, uh, chapter, or verse 4, Revelation 10, Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. Now, the seven thunders probably are very similar to the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls that are poured out. It's another series of seven uh, like that. And by sealing the seven thunders, it's like shortening the tribulation. It's like cutting it short. And that goes exactly with what Jesus said. Uh, Jesus said in Mark 13, verse 20, and unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. So Revelation 10.6 says uh, that the angel said there should be no more delay, verse 6 there. And then in verse 7, it says the mystery of God is finished. It's all done. It's completed. So it seems to me like God is shortening the tribulation by skipping over the seven thunders there. And he's doing this for the sake of the elect. The elect have been praying. We're the ones that have been praying. How long, O Lord? Well, this is a partial answer to the prayer, I think. He's shortening the tribulation there. Uh, verses 5 through 7. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be no delay any longer, but the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. So verse 6 says that God created the earth and the things that are in it, the sea, everything in it. And then when we come to chapter 13, we find out there are two beasts. One of the beasts comes out of the sea. The other beast comes out of the earth. And so ahead of time, God is saying, or the angel is saying, that he has control over everything in the sea, over everything in the earth. God is in charge. He's letting, he's letting the churches know that ahead of time. The beasts are not in charge. Uh, that means the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth were created by God. And the created thing can never be greater than the creator. So God didn't create them to be evil. That was their choice. But he is Lord over the beast. We need to remember that, <clears throat> that he is Lord over every beast on earth. <clears throat> then the angel raises his hand, <clears throat> his hand and swears by God as though he is taking an oath. He says there should be no more delay. The prayers of the saints in Revelation 6 and 8 are about to be answered here. 
It says the mystery of God is finished in verse 7. A mystery is something that was not previously known, but is later revealed. It's not a secret that is never revealed. So when the angel declares that the mystery of God should be finished, it means that the full revelation of God is now finished. It's complete. Everything has been made known. God's plan is done and completed. It's a reminder to us that no doubt, uh, that there is no doubt about whether God's purposes will come to pass in our life, in our nation, in this world. They will come to pass. The angel swears that God has revealed, that what God has revealed is true and will be fulfilled. He's taking an oath. He's staking his, his life on it there. In other words, we don't need to worry. We don't need to be afraid about anything. We don't need to live in fear. Uh, there's no terrorist attack, no nuclear assault, no corruption in government, uh, no uh, military power or economic collapse or persecution that can stand in the way of God's word being fulfilled. Everything he says will be completed in your life, no matter what is happening in your life. And it will be completed in your nation's life, in Malaysia, no matter what is happening there. Verses 8 through 11. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel, and he said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and I will make, it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, this little book that John is given is similar to uh, the little book in Ezekiel 2 and 3. Ezekiel chapter 2, God speaks to Ezekiel and he says, I'm sending you to the rebellious nation of Israel. So Ezekiel is told not to be afraid and to speak even if Israel refuses to listen, which they did. And then Ezekiel is told to open his mouth and eat the book that God gives him. So the eating of the book is the same as speaking the word of God to the people. That's what he, it's a symbolic act. That's what he's doing there. Now, in Revelation 10, John is also given a little book to eat. Just as Ezekiel was commissioned by God to go to Israel, uh, John is also commissioned as a prophet to go to the rebellious nations of the world. And both Ezekiel's book and John's book taste sweet, but after they eat it, it becomes bitter in their stomach. It gives them a stomach ache. It tastes sweet because it's the promise of victory, but it's also bitter in their stomach because they're words of judgment and warning. So it's a bittersweet experience. The angel tells John to prophesy, but there's a problem. John is on the island of Patmos, and he cannot leave. How is he going to prophesy? But he can write down what he hears, and that's what he does. He writes it down, but someone else is going to actually have to speak it. Now, back in Revelation 1.3 and in Revelation 22.7, John tells his readers to hear and keep the words of prophecy in the book. I think this is what he's talking about right there. He's counting on the churches, the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and everyone else who reads the book to prophesy. And this is what the two witnesses will prophesy about in Revelation 11 and verse 3. Uh, let me ask you a question. Are you willing to eat the scroll? God has a scroll for you, I think, for each of us. Are you willing to eat it? Are you willing to go to a rebellious people? Are you willing to go to people who will ignore you, who don't want to listen to what you have to say? Because that's really the kind of people that God calls us to go to. See, it's not enough um, to just bring a Bible to church with us, uh, to carry it with us to church, but we have to digest 
the inside of the Bible. We have to digest what is in there. We have to hunger for the Word of God to let it become a part of us. That's what is happening with John here. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and a delight to my heart. So I think God has a scroll for each of us to eat. Are we willing to eat it, though? When we prophesy the words on the scroll, they will be sweet, we'll be happy. But when we're persecuted, it will be bitter, we'll be unhappy. But that's the way that God has planned it. We must be willing to accept difficulty just like John was willing to accept difficulty being on the island of Patmos. Now, and it isn't easy all the time, but this is how John was a witness to the Word of God, and it's how we are to be witnesses to the Word of God. We have to accept the bitter with the sweet. So John is told again to prophesy about many peoples and nations. Remember, we've said this before. This is kind of about the nations getting them to repent and come to the Lord. We know that's happening at some point. Um, and I'll give you a little secret. It does happen in chapter 11. So, but why is John told to prophesy again? You know, like the first time wasn't enough. John, you need to do this again. And the reason why is because the gospel has not yet been preached to all the nations. So the churches, the seven churches, John included, have to go out and keep preaching the word again and again until everywhere it's been reached. So the end will not come until the nations have all heard the good news. So to prophesy is to give God's perspective on what's happening in the present time. It's getting God's viewpoint of how he sees things, how he sees things in the world at that present time. And for those who are not following Jesus, it's a warning. Get your life together. If they don't pay attention to the warning signs in the world, judgment is coming. For those who are following Christ, it's an encouragement to persevere, to overcome, and to not compromise, to stay faithful to the Lord. And then if we do overcome, we will be rewarded. In Revelation 11, verse 3, the angel says to John, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Well, the two witnesses will also take the prophecy that John was given to the nations. Wearing sackcloth is a sign of mourning, and the two witnesses are mourning the sins of the nation. They're trying to convince angry nations uh, to listen to the Lord. Psalm 2 verse 1 says, why are the nations angry? And then Psalm 2 verse 5 says, God speaks to them in his wrath. Revelation 11:18 says this, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. That's a fulfillment of Psalm 2. God always does what he says he's going to do. He doesn't want to get angry, but his anger finally will come out in some form. The seven seals and seven trumpets show us what happens when the nations try to rule the world. When they try to be in charge and make everything go according to their plans, this is what happens. They don't want to be under God's guidance. And it doesn't get better at all. It only gets worse. Revelation 11 explains the cause of the church's persecution by the nations and the reason for the trumpets. The church is to be a prophetic witness to the reality of God's kingdom here on earth. And the trumpets are part of the delay until the gospel has been preached to all the nations. Now, Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So when it comes to chapter 11, the two witnesses, the temple and everything, there's basically two interpretations that you can take about all this. Either it's literal, you can take it, or it's symbolic. 
And so let's say, first, it's as at the temple, the altar, the worshipers are literal. Some people take them literal. They focus on the Jews and, the, and their place in the last days. But there is a couple problems with that, though. The main problem is that the temple does not exist. So if you take this literally, you have to have a temple, a real live temple. There is no temple anymore in Jerusalem. It was destroyed in 70 AD. And so this verse cannot be fulfilled unless that temple is rebuilt. And that's what some people predict will happen. Um, actually, where the temple is today, the Dome of the Rock Mosque is on that place, that very place. And that's a very sacred and holy place to Muslims. And so they're not about, I mean, if you ask them politely, will you please move that, you know, over here, they're not about to do that. You know, they're not, they're not going to do that. Now, some people have speculated, well, maybe there'll be an earthquake. Well, there's been two earthquakes, and they rebuilt both times. <laughs> so an earthquake isn't going to drive them away either. So as I look at this, I don't think it's probably literal. I think it's more symbolic, but you never know, but that's just my feeling. But the other feeling also, um, well, let me say... Um, there are a small group of Jews today who do want to rebuild the temple, and they want to offer animal sacrifices again, just like in the Old Testament and the time of Jesus. That's what they hope to do. Most uh, Jews in Israel don't want to do that. They're, they're non-religious. They don't really care so much about that. But there are a small group that do want to do that. Um, so... And Israel knows that if they were to do something to that sacred site, it would bring World War IV, because supposedly we're in World War III right now. So it would bring World War IV. Uh, probably every Muslim nation, including Malaysia, would send troops over there to take that back and to write what they feel would be a wrong. So even Israel does not want their own people to build the temple again there. They, they don't want to take that chance of of uh, being ostracized by the rest of the world as, as bad as it is now. Um, and the other thing to think about here is why would God want the temple built again anyway? Why, does he, why would he want animal sacrifices again anyway? I mean, didn't Jesus die for everyone? Doesn't, isn't that the end of the sacrificial system? I, I think that's why... The temple was destroyed in 70 AD by Rome in the first place. God allowed that because he knew once that's gone, there can be no more sacrificial system, no more animal sacrifices. And so I don't think God wants that. Maybe man does, but I don't think God really wants that. So then there is another uh, interpretation, which I think is a little more reasonable, and that would be that it's symbolic. So the, this view, the temple, the altar, the worshipers are symbolic. They refer to the true Israel, which I think would be the church. Now, in verse 1, John was given a reed like a measuring rod. In Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem is also measured. In Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem is called the bride and the lamb's wife. That's the church, okay? And it's measured again there. Then in Revelation 3.12, it says that those who conquer will be made a pillar in the temple of my God. That's another indication that the temple in Revelation represents the church, the true people of God. And this agrees with what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And he also said it in 2 Corinthians 6. Uh, 6 you are the temple of the living God. So he's talking about the church in both cases there. And in Ephesians 2, 20 and 21, he's talking about the church and says it has been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So the chief cornerstone of the temple is Jesus himself. The apostles and prophets are the foundation the people of God are the pillars that hold it up and the living stones that are being built into the holy temple of the Lord. So it seems to me like the temple of God is the church. 
Now, we read about the temple of God in Revelation 11. We are reading about the true people of God, both Jew and Gentile, who decide to follow Jesus. And they are measured for protection from spiritual harm. Now, this is very similar to the ceiling of the 144,000 that we saw in chapter 7. They also were sealed as a, way, so, uh, as a way of knowing that they were spiritually protected from any harm that would happen in the tribulation. They would not have to worry about anything. They were under God's protection. This is kind of the same thing that's being done here. Again, being measured is being protected. Uh, in verse 2, John was told not to measure the outer court because it belongs to the Gentiles. Well, the Gentile nations will have control of the city of Jerusalem, which is why it is not being measured. Uh, they will trample over the holy city of Jerusalem for 42 months. The temple is to be measured and preserved, but the outer court, which is not measured, will not be preserved. Throughout the book of Revelation, we see that God's people are always spiritually protected, but they still go through tribulation. So those in the temple will be protected, yet some will suffer. I think Jerusalem is being used here as a symbol for the entire earth. The angry nations trample over the earth, but the people of God are spiritually protected. So what is the significance of the 42 months? Well, if the temple and the altar and Jerusalem are symbolic, then I think the 42 months also has to be symbolic. Now, many people see it, take it literally, if they take the others literally as well, and it's really three and a half years, 42 months. But if you see it as symbolic, then the 42 months would also be symbolic. Maybe it, uh, Daniel prophesied about a time of tribulation that would last 42 months, Daniel 7 and Daniel 12. And for Daniel, that was far off in the future, but for, Jan, for John, it's right then. Uh, the two witnesses can be compared to Moses and Elijah. Elijah was in uh, the wilderness for 42 months, didn't rain for 42 months. That's what happened during that time. So there's a connection there. So I would see the 42 months as probably representing the entire time of the tribulation. Uh, Revelation 11, verses 3 through 6 and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Okay, so who are the two witnesses? Well, I have heard of people who said, hey, I'm one, you know. Sometimes they've actually come to my home, and I'll say, are you the two? Are you one of the witnesses? Yes, I am one of the... <laughs> They're also one of the 144,000, too. They're... Anyway, there are some people who believe they are. Actually, I think all of you are. Again, I'm, th I'm looking at this more symbolically. Some people see it literally. Some people see it symbolically. Uh, there's some obvious comparisons with Moses and Elijah. And so uh, I think that would mean that the two witnesses would function very s in a similar way to Moses and Elijah. Uh, Moses stood up to Pharaoh, and he released the ten plagues. He freed Israel. Elijah stood up to Ahab and called down fire from heaven, prayed that it would not rain for three and a half years. Uh, both wanted to free God's people from bondage. But I don't think it means that Elijah and Moses are literally going to come back to life and be the two witnesses. So if you take it literally, then I think these two people will uh, function like Moses and Elijah. Now, the other viewpoint is that the two witnesses are a symbol for the entire church. Now, you might say, well, wasn't the temple and everything, wasn't that the church too? Yep, it was too. In fact, you see some of these symbols like this. They represent the same thing. It's looking at something from a different point of view. Uh, so if that's true, then the entire church will be prophesying like Moses and Elijah did. In Revelation 1.20, it says the seven churches are the seven lampstands. So it's likely that the two witnesses, who are also called lampstands, are the church. 
You can make that connection there. God will give power to his church to prophesy 1,260 days, just like Elijah did. And the two witnesses are also called olive trees. This comes from a vision from Zechariah chapter 4. In Zechariah, there are two witnesses there, Joshua, who is the high priest, Zerubbabel, the king, and it says they were standing like olive trees before the lampstand. The olive trees were providing oil to light the lamps. Then verse 5 says, if anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouth and devours their enemies. Now, it's interesting to note that in Luke 9, the disciples wanted to imitate Elijah by calling down fire upon a Samaritan village. Uh, and Jesus rebuked them, which is another idea that maybe this is going to be symbolic. Maybe there's not going to be fire coming out of our mouths. You know, don't get that idea that fire maybe is going to come out of your mouth and burn people up who reject you or reject what you're saying. Uh, Jesus rebuked them and he said to them, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. The spirit, the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. That is the whole point. And then it says, and they went to another village. So that village rejected Jesus. So Jesus just went to another village. That's what you do. When somebody rejects you, okay, you go find another person. You go to another person, to another village. But we don't literally call down fire from heaven. But there are consequences to rejecting the gospel. And that's kind of, I think, what John is getting at there. Uh, when we are rejected in one place, we leave and we go to another place. So verses 7 through 13 uh, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half years, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, you might know that the Greek word for witness is martis, and the English word for martyr comes from that Greek word. Every martyr is a witness. Not every witness, though, is a martyr. Just so you, some of you were a little bit afraid of that, I know. So not every witness is a martyr. Uh, so it should not surprise us when verse 7 says that the beast will kill the two witnesses. Now, one thing we see in this passage is that the life of the two is the life of the two witnesses. I think the church is being modeled after the life of Jesus. In both cases, there's preaching, there's signs and wonders taking place, which results in opposition from the enemy. There's persecution, rejection, followed by a violent death in Jerusalem. The nations look upon the two witnesses and rejoice. Some people mock Jesus when he was on the cross. Then we have the resurrection and ascension in a cloud. The church, I think, is going to go through exactly what Jesus did. Exactly what Jesus did. John, and this goes with what Jesus says. He said in John 15, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. That was a promise he made to us. Verse 7 is the description of what will occur at the end of history. So the measuring in verse 1 preserves the church and its prophetic witness until everything is finished. The ministry of the two witnesses is not cut short. They're able to finish everything that God wanted them to do. Only after the two witnesses finish their testimony does the beast ascend out of the bottomless pit. <clears throat> now, this is the same bottomless pit mentioned in Revelation 9 and the same beast mentioned in chapter 13. 
<clears throat> and it says, the beast will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. God gave the two witnesses time to preach the message of salvation. The gospel has now been preached to every nation, and now the end can come. Afterwards, God removes his supernatural protection from them, and he allows the beast to attack them and kill them. Now, the whole point here is that no one will be able to stop those two prophets until God's appointed time in verse 7. And this is what Jesus experienced too. He could not be killed before his time had come. In fact, it says a couple of times that uh, no one could lay a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Uh, Jesus could not be stopped from completing God's work, and these two witnesses will not be stopped from completing God's work. And that's true of the church today. Nothing can stop us from, doing, from going to all the nations. Whatever God has called you to do, he will see to it that your assignment is completed. Now in verse 8, it says that their dead bodies will lie in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. I don't think that means that the entire church will be martyred, but the church will become silent uh, at that time. And most people might be either dead or in hiding. And we kind of saw that uh, with Elijah back in 1 Kings. Elijah, that says there were 7,000 prophets that were hidden in caves. Elijah thought he was the only one, but God said, no, there's 7,000 more that I have, at least. Uh, and so it's very possible that the church will either be in hiding or something like that. The angel says to John, the beast that comes out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And these are the same words that the angel spoke to Daniel when he said about the fourth beast rising from the sea that would make war on God's people and overcome them. So again, you have a connection with Daniel there. Now, is the great city in verse 8 actually Jerusalem? Because at first it kind of sounds like it. Many think so. But in every instance in Revelation where the words great city are used, they refer to Babylon, not to Jerusalem. Six times the words great city are used in chapter 17 and 18, which is about Babylon. Uh, and Babylon is really kind of a code word for Rome. So in a sense, we're talking about the Roman Empire there as well. The great city is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. And the, uh, the word spiritually means that the city is not to be understood in a literal sense, but this is symbolic right here. The great city is compared here to Sodom because of its wickedness and to Egypt because, of the, because they persecuted the people of God. In verse 8 it says, where also their Lord was crucified. Now that sounds like Jerusalem, definitely, right? But remember... Jesus was crucified by sinners everywhere. No matter where you lived, you had a hand, and your sin was there crucifying Jesus on the cross. So it does not have to be taken literally that it has to be in that city of Jerusalem. Like Jerusalem, they turned their back on Christ. All sinners are responsible for the death of Jesus. Verse 9 says that all the nations will see their bodies. Uh, some have said this could be done by TV, and maybe that's true, but it's also true that if it is the worldwide church, some will see their dead bodies maybe in every country, you know, there will be there. So you could also be done that way as well. Most of the prophets in the Old Testament suffered. They faced rejection. They were killed. So it does not mean that the two witnesses, either individuals or the entire church, will escape suffering and death. Suffering and death itself will be the final prophetic sign through which the world will glorify God. I think so many other things happen beforehand, but it's really not until people start dying, there's suffering, there's persecution, there's martyrdom, that suddenly that changes the nations, just like the death of Christ changed the world. Verse 10 says, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over the death of the two witnesses. In Revelation, the phrase, those who dwell on the earth, always refers to the unbelieving. And they're going to have a party. They're going to celebrate. 
The two witnesses prophesy for three and a half years. This is the same amount of time that the holy city is trampled underfoot, and the woman flees into the wilderness in Revelation 12, 6. And both the city and I think the woman represent the church there. So there's all these connections you can make there. Verse 11 says, After three and a half days, the breath of life came into the two witnesses, and they stood on their feet. It says, Great fear fell on those who saw them. Now, in that moment, they must have realized that they had been deceived by the dragon. If you take this as symbolism for the church, it's hard to believe that every single Christian on earth will die. There are 2.4 billion Christians on earth right now. I mean, you can imagine all of us dying, 2.4 billion. And if it delays longer, there could be more, 3 billion someday, maybe more than that. So it's hard for me to see this, that every Christian is going to die. Um, this may be more like Ezekiel 37, where God restored Israel out of the Babylonian exile. Israel is described there as a dead body with only dry bones. Uh, this is what it says, very similar words here in uh, uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 5. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And then in verse 10, so I prophesied, and he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. So it could again be something like that. Now, some believe that the resurrection in verse 11 is literal and refers to the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Verse 12, then, would be the rapture of the church, which would refer to those alive in Christ. Others would say that it's symbolism that showed God vindicating the church in the eyes of the world. Then verse 13, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, if only a tenth of the city fell, that means 90% of the city survived. 90% fear God and give him glory. That's what it's saying there. If only 7,000 are killed in the earthquake, it means the rest fear God, and give him glory. So I don't think it was the earthquake that changed their mind. There have been worse earthquakes than that one there, but it was the death and resurrection of the two witnesses. This is where the nations finally come to repent. Remember, we've been saying back about the seven seals that this is all the fault of the nations. They're making things worse upon earth. It's not God judging people, but it's these nations who are out of control and are doing things that are just causing the earth to be much worse than it really is. So the idea of people coming in fear to God is evidence of a true turning to God. In chapter 9, those that survived the plagues did not repent, it says. But here in verse 13, after the earthquake, they are afraid and give God glory. In chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, it says the nations are told to fear God and give him glory. And then in Revelation 15, 4, it says, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For all the nations shall come and worship before you. So this is finally the place where the nations come to repent and come to glorify God. So it looks to me like John is describing a global harvest of souls coming into the kingdom at the end of the age. And this great harvest is also mentioned in chapter 14. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 39, that the harvest is at the end of the age. Uh, verse 14, the second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. The first woe was the fifth trumpet. The second woe is past, so that was the sixth trumpet. The third and last woe is the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet includes the seven bowls that will be poured out upon the earth. Revelation 11:15 says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. When Jesus first came, he brought the kingdom with him. 
The kingdom is here now, but it's not in fullness yet. It's just here partially. But this verse is about the coming of the kingdom in fullness. When Jesus returns the second time, then the kingdom will be in fullness. The seventh trumpet is a declaration that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. So the nations have finally repented. Jesus is taking all the nations as his inheritance. Psalm 2.8 says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. And that, of course, includes Malaysia. This is what the book of Revelation really is all about. It's establishing God's kingdom on earth. And the last three verses, 16 through 19, and the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hell." So the 24 elders worship God because he has taken power from demonic, evil, human authorities on earth. And that is a big reason to celebrate and to worship the Lord. So this is a moment worthy of worship. Then in verse 18, it says, his wrath has come to the nations. His wrath is the seven bold judgments that are going to be poured out in chapter 16. Revelation 17 says, the one who is and who was... Now, this is very similar to Revelation 1.4. And there, John spoke of God as the one who was and is and is to come. Notice those words, and is to come, is missing here. He's describing God who is and was because the future has now arrived in the present. The is to come has become reality. So then it says, you have taken your great power and ruled. Satan has been the ruler of the earth up to this point in time. Mark 12, 1 talks about a man traveling to a far country. He leased his land to the vine dressers. They rule in his place, but they rule over his land in a corrupt way. And they kill those sent by the owner. What will the owner do? It says he will come and destroy the vine dressers, and then he will rule over his land. And that's what we see happening here. Verse 18 says, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. The nations don't stand a chance against God's wrath. And it's fine to some of them, the message is getting through. Psalm 211 tells them to kiss the son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. Make up with him. <laughs> That's what it's saying there. You know, like when you get in an argument with your wife, you know, kiss her, tell her you were wrong. So it's good practice to do that. So then it says, in the time of the dead, that they should be judged. It is time for those who have, di who have died to be judged for their works, and that will take place in Revelation 20. And all that remains is for God to destroy those who destroy the earth. Those that are destroyed are the dragon, both of the beasts, the kings of the earth, demons, fallen angels, and anyone who decides to follow them. All of them will be thrown into the lake of fire. So, when we meet online again, we will start with chapter 12. Let me pray just to end with. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, um, that you will give us courage to be just like the two witnesses, even if we're not actually the two witnesses, Lord, if I'm wrong about that, we are still witnesses for you. We want to speak the truth with power, Lord, and we need your uh, Holy Spirit to help us do that. We ask that you would guard our hearts and our minds from deception, Lord, and guide us through uh, times of trial and tribulation. Empower us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses to your love and grace in this world. Help us to persevere uh, through the challenges, Lord, and to share your hope with others. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.